If someone who didn't know you was seeking to gain perspective on your life, your priorities, what you deeply value, what would they say? What would they say? How, if not having a prior relationship with you, would somebody measure what those priorities are, what, are, what those values are, what the fruitfulness of the investment of your time, your financial resources, and your spiritual gifts would be? What would be the measure? I think people would look at where we show up, what we do more than anything else, where we spend our money, who we spend our time with, and what is accomplished by the investment of all of those things working together. Sometimes we have the best of intentions when we set out to do something, don't we? I remember when I first set out in ministry, I was going to change the world. <laughs> but then the practicalities of life and work set in, and things unfold a little differently than we might anticipate. It's good every now and again to get on the balcony, so to speak, to gain perspective over your life and to say, what is my life about these days? Where am I being fruitful in the way in which I show up, in which I give? What might I change if things don't line up with my intention in order to be even more fruitful in my living? This question applies to church as well, this community that we steward together by the grace of God. I wonder if the community were to look at us, what would they say we value most? What would be the fruit of the investment of our financial resources, our time, and our spiritual gifts? What are we known for to our neighbors? I believe this question is so important, just as it is in our own individual lives, it is in our church as well. What are we accomplishing for the Lord together? What are the fruits of all of our efforts? And do our actions line up with our intentions? Let's get on the balcony together for a bit to look at what God is building through us and what has been built over the years. If you're in worship with us here in this physical space, we know others are worshiping online and others will worship with us on television. We see the value of prioritizing our faith, of meeting with God, of learning the Word and beginning to apply it to our lives. Over the years, a cathedral has been built right here on Main Street so that we, together as a congregation, can bear witness to the love of God, to the Word of God, to our city. That was amplified when we as a church built a West Campus, at the time on the leading edge of growth in Houston, a large sanctuary where people could gather around the Word of God, could give thanks for all that God is doing in their lives and in the world, can refuel and recharge so that they can go and make a difference in the community. So our facilities communicate something, a prioritization of the Word of God, of worship, of prayer in our life together. Would you say that's right? I would. I, I look at other things that we've built together, the fruitfulness of our work and our ministry. Uh, I was privileged to attend a luncheon the other day, a prayer luncheon at the Junior League of Houston. Uh, Mattress Mac spoke, and it benefited Neighbors in Action. What a phenomenal ministry that was birthed here out of First Methodist Houston. That is a ministry that is reshaping an entire neighborhood, changing the trajectory of generations by empowering those who live there in Port Houston to invest in their own neighborhood, in the lives of their own neighbors. I was touched when the women that are a part of Neighbors in Action sent floral arrangements, donated them to be sold so that they could participate in the raising of funds and the raising of prayers for the ministry in which they benefit from and participate in. That's a wonderful fruit of our work together, isn't it, dear friends? 
and this week I was privileged with Pastor Amanda to attend a lunch at the Wesley Community Center in the near north side area of Houston. That was birthed right here out of First Methodist Houston, and it is still transforming a neighborhood that is itself transitioning by empowering those that live there to improve their lives, to enrich their education, to give them career preparedness and a pathway to meaningful work through partnerships like Houston Methodist Hospital. Wesley Community Center is another fruit of our work together. Well, friends, we have been through a time and a season, haven't we? If you look over the past decade in the life of our church, you see a trajectory that we are hoping to arrest and turn around together with the Lord's help. We've experienced about a 10-year decrease in attendance, but now by the grace of God, that's beginning to, to increase again. COVID set us back, didn't it? We can't make excuses for COVID, but we need to name that COVID impacted the momentum that could gather in our work together. We all were trying to figure out what life would be like, trying to, to not get this disease that we didn't want spreading more rapidly than our hospitals could keep up. And so now, as we, as a culture, as a church, come out of COVID, you know, we're missing some people, aren't we? People that are in our Sunday school classes, people who sit in these pews next to us. And I believe we're not fully who we're meant to be without all of the people who call First Methodist home being here and joining with us in the work. Wouldn't you agree? We have more work to do, don't we? So as we make this turn together as a congregation, as we have come, I believe, to the end of a pastoral transition, a season where we've been through a lot together, it's time for us to build on a foundation that is becoming more and more stable and getting stronger and stronger to ask what will be our impact together in the next 5, 10, 20, 30 years down the road. And our work this coming year will be to discern that together, to name it, and to move together for the future that God intends. Paul was writing the letter to the Second Corinthians to a church in Corinth a church that he was trying to encourage to be generous for an urgent and pressing need in the church in Jerusalem. This is a church that Paul dearly loves, a people that Paul has poured a lot into, and a people who are not reaching their full potential. Paul writes in praise of the efforts of Christians in Macedonia who had been through an affliction, a huge ordeal. They were living by all means in poverty in the way that the world defines it, with a lack of material resources, and yet they heard of the need in Jerusalem, and they gave even beyond their means in order to meet the need of that community. Paul is intentionally writing here. In the Greek, he doesn't use any word that can be translated money. What Paul is dealing with here, I think, is a central challenge and opportunity for all of us. He's dealing with the heart. Because, friends, generosity, first and foremost, is a posture of our hearts, isn't it? It's the orientation of our lives. Generosity is a value that helps us to steward our time our financial resources, our spiritual gifts, our relationships in ways that honor God and glorify God and bring God's kingdom near. God is calling the church in Corinth to generosity. What I love about what He says here is using the Macedonian church as an example, He said that they gave voluntarily according to their means, even beyond their means. Paul says, I wasn't even going to ask them to participate, at least it's implied, because of the challenges that they're facing, but they impressed upon me that they wanted to give a gift. And I might have had a number in mind, but they exceeded anything that I could have possibly imagined. And he gives this as an example for this church. He says, here's how they did it. And this is where I want to focus us in these few minutes. 
He said that they gave themselves first to the Lord, and then by the will of God to us, that is, Paul and other leaders of the church, so that we might urge Titus that as he has already made a beginning, that he should complete this generous undertaking among you. If you read the letter to the church in Corinth, the first letter, 1 Corinthians, you can kind of see that First Church Corinth wasn't the healthiest place in the world. They dealt with every conflict imaginable. They quarreled over leaders. Am I going to follow Paul or Apollos? They quarreled under who could sit at the Lord's table to celebrate the Lord's Supper together, and they climbed hierarchy at those gatherings. They quarreled about spiritual gifts and that tongues were the most important gift of all, and all the other ones were subservient. And Paul says, no, the greatest gift is love. This is a church divided. It's a church that struggles to remain faithful to Christ in the face of a culture that is very different from the one that Paul is teaching. And so, how is he calling them to do the work that he's imploring of them? He says, give yourself first to the Lord. Now, friends, I know that there are a lot of reasons to be frustrated or to wane in your enthusiasm. I get that way too. You know, we like to start things, don't we, as human beings? There's a lot of enthusiasm up front, but then after we've done something for a while, we begin to lose interest. How many of you set New Year's resolutions? Anyone? You don't have to raise your hand and out yourself. I used to, but I've kind of given up on that because I've realized I don't make quick enough progress, and so I kind of move on to other things. The barometer for me is always Lent. If by the time Lent is beginning in February, mid or late February, if I haven't made progress on my resolutions, it's kind of a good time to re-up on those, right? But I've realized how short I fall at the ambitious goals I have for myself as a New Year's beginning. And honestly, I've pivoted a little bit. Instead of setting unrealistic expectations for myself that I will be disappointed that I haven't achieved and quickly enough, I focus a little more spiritually on a word. What is one word that will lead me closer to Christ this year that I can incorporate more deeply into my life? And that becomes a spiritual practice. It becomes an inward journey that hopefully reflects outward. And no longer am I defined by what I haven't done, but on my best days, what God is doing in me. We always have enthusiasm at the beginning, but we wane. Paul says this too. He says, look, y'all began this work last year. You had the best of intentions. Now you're growing a little cold. Finish the work. That's his admonition to the church. I know we've been through a challenging season, haven't we? I talked about the 10 years of decline. That was numerical. It was also financial. And we're arresting that and beginning to turn that around. We still have a lot of work to do. But we had numerous pastoral transitions. If you look over the last decade, you've had lots of associate pastor turnover. You've had senior pastor turnover too over the last 10 years. I think I'm the third senior pastor in 10 years. That's a lot after a long tenured appointment and then a shorter tenured appointment. It's a lot of change. And you had a long season last year of uncertainty when your pastor went on leave and you got an interim pastor and you had an amazing executive pastor that carried the mantle and kept things moving during that time. It can be so easy when we're going through times of uncertainty to say, I don't know if I'm all in anymore. I don't know if this is going to be the place for me. I, I, you know, my need, I have this idea of what I want, and the church just isn't doing that for me. And, I, I, you know, there may be something shinier out there that I might find and come across at some point, and ah, if something better comes along, or, yeah, the church doesn't do this by a particular time, I'm out. That's a way that enthusiasm wanes, isn't it? But the way that the church in Macedonia got past that was that they devoted themselves first to the Lord. And friends, if we devote ourselves first to the Lord, 
and God is what we're seeking first and as our source and primary aim, and we're having our soul fed by our relationship with God, what a starting point that is, isn't it? They gave themselves first to the Lord and then to the leadership of the church. What a great orientation. Because once you're seeking God with everything you've got, with all of your heart and your soul and your mind and your strength, then if you dedicate yourself to the work of God through Christ's church, you're able to say, you know what, I'm all in. I, I realize that the church isn't everything that I want it to be and that the Lord wants it to be, and I realize I am part of the church. We together will get to the place that God is leading us, but it takes hard work and dedication I'm not going to be on the fence anymore about whether I'm in or out. I'm going to be all in so that the work of God can be brought to completion through my participation with all of the other saints in the call that God has placed upon our church. That's the way that this church in Macedonia excelled in the work of generosity because they were fully devoted not only to the church in their own community but to the church beyond in Jerusalem. They realized something was at work that was bigger than just funding the church budget. What was at stake was the propagation of the gospel throughout the world. And what the church of Macedonia recognized as a need in one part of the church was their need too. And that in given freely of what God had entrusted to them, God would supply all that they needed to sustain and strengthen their community, even grow it, while God provided through them for the needs of Christians in another part of the kingdom. That is a beautiful vision. Paul encourages the church in Corinth. He says, now that you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in utmost eagerness, and in our love for you, we want you to excel in this generous undertaking. And so, I look at our church and I say, man, we excel in so many things. We're a church that wants to teach the Bible and to learn to apply it in our lives. We want others to find their lives changed by the gospel of Jesus Christ as we share good news with them. We want to share God's Word broadly, which is why we're broadcasting on television and the radio and on the internet. We have… Uh, we can trace those who worship with us online every week, and there are over 500 unique persons watching us participating in our service online every single week. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. We are committed to sharing the gospel. We're committed to enriching lives through mission. Pastor Amanda talked about Lifeline and our food pantry and Thanksgiving in a bag that's coming up, right? Those are all things that we need to do. But do you think God's done with us yet? Really, do you think God's done? Do you think that's it? All the work that God has set before us? Do you? What? What? No, God's not done with us yet. In fact, I would say that God's just getting started, that we can celebrate all of those amazing things that God has done in, through, and among us over 185 years. But I think we're, we're on the threshold of something great. I think that God is positioning us to do even more for others to come to know His mercy grace, and love in this century. Wouldn't you agree? We are entering a season of vision, of determining what the next milestone and mountaintop is going to be that God is leading us to conquer together. We're going to be able to build upon the strong and stable foundation that we've been working on over this last year. And together, we're going to name what it is that we're going to do together over the next decade to help build upon all of the things that we already excel in so that even more people can experience the mercy, the grace, the compassion, and the great love and care of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm excited to be a part of that work with you. You know, I heard a story, uh, I remember this from years ago, of a couple that was going to row a boat across the Atlantic Ocean. Do you all remember this story? And it was a husband and wife together, and apparently the husband didn't quite make the journey. He got tired, and he hitched a ride on a tanker 
or something that uh, had come by, left his wife to finish the journey alone. Uh, when people who followed this story actually mapped it out, they discovered that the husband had made it about a third of the journey, and the wife paddled the remaining two-thirds by herself. It seems like he was eager to start, but with waning enthusiasm, he didn't quite make it to the finish line. Well, Paul is encouraging the church at Corinth to finish what they started in the pledges that they had made the previous year of their desire to help enrich the Christian community across the world by giving generously to the offering for the church in Jerusalem. And I'm encouraging all of us to complete the work, to continue to feed the eagerness that we had at the beginning and to see the work through to its completion. I'm asking you to be all in, to give generously not only of your financial resources. Remember, generosity is first and foremost a matter of the heart. Friends, I want to know that you're all in here to doing the work of God through First United Methodist Church of Houston. I need you to be all in. It's going to take volunteer effort in this next season to make vision reality every member investing time in the work of the church so that we can build things like Neighbors in Action and Wesley Community Center, so we can touch the lives of our neighbors who have not yet found the church home. That doesn't just happen with intent. It happens as we roll up our sleeves and get busy, right? And so, I have a task for all of us as an application of this message today. You ready? This is my charge for all of us. I'm going to talk about Commitment Sunday and just just a moment. But my heart yearns for people who are a part of our church that we haven't seen since COVID began or even before to be in these pews and in these Sunday school classrooms and serving at our food pantry and lifeline right next to us. You know who they are. I haven't met them yet because I'm newish here. I know the people that I know who are a part of the things that we're doing, but you know. And so, what I'm asking is that you reach out to members of our church family that we haven't seen participating in a long time. And I know that part of the reason why people get disconnected is because of time. Maybe the pandemic hit and people were mostly homebound during that time. And when you've been absent from community for a while, you don't want to face the inquisition when you come back. You know all the questions, where have you been? And if the answer was, oh, you know, I was hiking Kilimanjaro and hunting bears and, you know, if we don't have a story like that, if the story is, you know, I discovered that I really like brunch on Sundays. It's a really great thing, and and, and I I realize how comfortable it is to be able to worship at home on my couch with my cup of coffee and my dog in my lap, and I honestly, I just didn't want to answer all the questions when I came back because that didn't sound like a good enough excuse. This is where I need you. It is good enough because God wants all of our hearts, right? We want people to return. And so, some of it is hearing all of that and saying, you know, I can really appreciate that, but I want you to know that we miss you so much. We are not all of who God is intending for us to be without you here working alongside of us, worshiping and learning alongside of us. We would love for you to come back and be a part of what God's doing here at the church. And I tell you what, when you're ready, let me know. We can meet up in the parking lot, or I'll even pick you up and walk in with you, and I'll answer the questions. I'll deflect them so that you can enjoy the marvelous homecoming I know God has for you in the people of First Methodist Houston. I need you all to help me with that. Will you do that? Because I, every Sunday I come and worship I see empty spaces, and I know those represent people that we love and that we dearly care about. It's going to take all of us working together to help people come home. Next thing that I want to ask of you is uh, to be mindful that Commitment Sunday is coming next week. Uh, How many of you received a a commitment packet, an actual physical letter from the church in your mailbox? Somebody told me this morning, I got mail from the church and was confused. (laughs) We We don't send a lot of mail these days. I love to do handwritten cards. That's neat to get things that are handwritten in the mail. But you got a packet, a letter, a commitment card. Open that up and begin to pray, Lord, how would you have me be generous 
in your ways through the church in the year ahead. Next Sunday is Commitment Sunday. It's a great day to bring that card filled out and to place it in the offering plate, but you can mail it back. You can bring it next time you're here. You can make your commitment online when you're ready. There's no rush. But I want to ask you to pray about something. As an effort to better align all of our ministries, we are combining our mission and our general ministries pledges into one. It's going to be a one fund. And that's intentional. 